You've heard AM, you've heard FM. Now, tune into DM Radio, the world's longest running show about data. Each week, host Eric Cavanaugh interviews the brightest minds in the world of information management. Want to be on a show? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. Now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Gentlemen, it's time once again for the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yes, indeed, yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh. And folks, we're going to talk about a pretty important topic in the world of data. We're going to talk about data quality and really quality processes. So quality is as quality processes do is the title of our show. We have several great guests lined up for you today. We'll be hearing from Kyle Kerwin from a company called Big Eye. We've got Maria Hentz from a company called Toluna and my buddy Rohit Chowdhury from uh, another company in this space doing some very cool work, Excel Data, all from different angles too. This is gonna be a lot of fun because you know, data quality has always been an issue. And if you've ever gotten an email addressed to someone else or with your name misspelled or gotten something in the mail with your name misspelled, happens to me all the time. People call me Kevin, but no, Kevin no, is my last name. Eric is the first name. They kind of fuse those two and call me Kevin, which happens all the time, it's fine. But uh, data quality problems can cause lots of trouble. Years ago, the Data Warehousing Institute did a whole report on the financial cost of bad quality data, and it was just through the roof. The amount of money companies spend mailing things to people who don't live there anymore, emailing people who don't read this stuff anymore, getting the names wrong. Customer experience, of course, is always harmed by bad quality. But you know, in the old days, data quality was typically done in initiatives where you would just come in and do a sort of cleansing and you would fix the fields where you had a last name and the phone number column and things of this nature. But then as soon as that project was done, slowly but surely the entropy would start chipping away and the quality would go down and you would overwrite good data with bad. Well, today there are lots of ways to handle data quality. We're gonna hear from three different perspectives here. So maybe just a quick opening statement from each of you. Uh, Marie Hens from Toluna, say a couple words about yourself. And, uh, and your vision of good data quality. Yes, thanks for having me on. Um, so Toluna is a global market research company, which means we have um, access to hundreds of thousands of people across um, all corners of the world. Um, and what we help companies and organizations do is uh, do market research studies and collect data and collect opinions. Um, and at Toluna, I'm responsible for data quality, so that means uh, looking at methodology, how data is collected, how data is cleaned. Um, and I also work really closely with the uh, fraud department that looks at the quality of our respondents. Um, and yeah, so I'll be looking at the first step uh, of data quality today, which is data collection. And that's such an excellent point. And we've heard garbage in, garbage out for years that will never go away. But I love the, the approach of the, the methodology and making sure that it is proven that it is auditable, that you're getting good quality data in. I mean, that's the best place to address data quality is on ingest when you get the data. You do need to be able to update it over time. And we're getting some of these new append only databases out there, which are pretty cool because you can always roll back, right? It used to be you wrote over the data, then you'd have to write over it again. Well, if you write over good data with bad, that's not so good, right? But uh, these append only databases, that it's an interesting development in the sort of matrix of technologies out there. But I'll throw it now over to uh, Kyle Kerwin from Big Eye. Tell us a bit about yourself and what you want to talk about today. Uh, hey, Eric. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, so I'm Kyle. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Big Eye. Um, Big Eye is a data observability platform. Uh, we're about three years old. And um, uh, before Big Eye, I was the uh, product lead for Uber's uh, data operations tools team. So. A lot of what we do here at Big Eyes is inspired by uh, techniques that we kind of pioneered uh, to keep data reliable at Uber. Um, they went from some Postgres machines to a Vertica data warehouse to a multi-hundred petabyte data lake and um, wow. several several thousand folks working on data pipelines kind of all at the same time. Data quality oh, wow. is a pretty big challenge at that scale. So um, yeah, here to talk about uh, data reliability engineering and how we can bring some uh, practices from software engineering over to the data quality space. Yeah, and that's great news. And I'm, I'm glad you offered that history 
because this is, I think, one of the more fascinating aspects of our industry is that you will get companies like Yahoo originally, I think, was the almost the genesis of this, this phenomenon, let's call it, because in the late 2000s, you had this exodus from Yahoo, and there were probably 30 or 40 senior engineers who went all over creation and started all these different companies. And that whole big data movement, if you look at it, a lot of them came out of Yahoo. Of course, that's where uh, Matt Produce was first engineered, and then it was open sourced, and uh, it became the foundation of Hadoop for, uh, for that whole big data movement. But we're seeing it now again, and you're a perfect example of this, where folks who are in these big companies doing really amazing things with technology, they rolled themselves, they rolled their own. And you learn about the practices, you learn about working with distributed systems, which in and of itself is a whole new ocean of challenges and problems and opportunities. And, and it, a lot of it has to be learned the hard way. You have to see the pain points, experience them, and then figure out engineering ways to work around it. So I'm very curious to get your perspective on this today. And then last but not least, we've got Rohit Chowdhury from Excel Data, also doing really interesting things on pulling data from lots of different sources to give that strategic view of data quality and processes. Tell us a bit about uh, what you're doing, Rohit. Oh, but I think you're on mute. Yeah. Hey, Eric. Thank you so much for having me today on the show. So uh, you're right. We're basically a multidimensional data observability platform. And our goal is to enable enterprises to build better data products. Um, Today, when you look around the industry, everybody's trying to build a data product, trying to satisfy customer needs faster, get to them sooner, get to the best possible recommendation, next best action. All of this is getting powered by data. So today, when we look at you know, what people are trying to accomplish with these data products, it essentially is something which is operational in nature. And I think that is a core of the problem that we solve that you know, how do you basically become more efficient with your operations? How do you ensure Data is reliable as it goes into the hands of the business folks. And how do you make sure that you know your costs and resources are always aligned with your overall you know, financial goals as a company? Uh, yeah. The company is about four years old. My most recent job, you know, as you were just talking about Hortonworks and Hadoop, I was at Hortonworks and I was a director of engineering running open source, closed source, and commercial projects. You know, back then we had this epiphany of you know that this whole world is going to be multi-technology and multi-generational in terms of the technology choices and the complexity of data is not going to slow down. So I think we are right in the thick of it. And I think you know, data is going to further explode from here. So happy to be on the show and would love to talk more. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We are right in the thick of it. It's a very, very exciting time. Um, you know, there is this whole array of systems, existing systems that we have to contend with as you're talking about brick and mortar businesses and they're all different. I mean, they're all heterogeneous. They all have their own way of solving things. You know, I often think that the blessing and curse of the information technology space, especially these days, is there are so many ways to get any given thing done. But first you need to understand what is the stack that we have? What is the DNA of our organization? What kind of solution is gonna work for us? And those are all open questions and they're, they're moving targets. But I think uh, a focus on first principles always helps and keeping an open mind about what we're doing. And then this whole movement to the cloud is a fantastic opportunity, not just to, to, to move somewhere else, but to really refactor, re-engineer, think through what you've been doing on-prem and find the clever ways to leverage what's available up in the cloud. Because that whole re-engineering process is extremely enlightening. And I think uh, folks like Marie Hens can help us understand with their market research, what to look for, where to go, what are the opportunities? So Marie, I'll throw it over to you to kind of dive into this whole uh, research side of understanding what's happening out there. So what are your thoughts on the sort of vector of, uh, of appreciation for data quality and all the processes that go into helping achieve it? Yeah, um, data quality has definitely become more of a topic over the last few years. So we very much, you know, look at data collection and we help different organizations with their decision making, um, but also, you know, collecting external data so that our clients can integrate that with their systems in their decision making processes and add that to their business intelligence. Um, so, uh, you know, like you were saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, prevention is better, more efficient and cheaper than remedy. And it will probably be more accurate as well. So ensuring that the data that goes into 
um, an analytic system or into, you know, um, into the database is good, um, is in our eyes, you know, the most important element of data and the decision making that happens on the back of the data or the marketing or whatever it may be, is just as good as the data that goes into it and that it's based on. And so what we really implement and what we you know, acknowledge is the scale of the task that we've got at hand. Like you were saying, there's no way we can manually go through data and read what people said in this survey, you know, because we have hundreds of thousands, if not you know, uh, millions of surveys uh, in our system throughout a year so it's impossible to do that manually so we really have to make sure we leverage technology and you know um, we work a lot with natural language processing algorithms to identify especially unstructured text and identify anything that's you know looking out of the ordinary there to make sure that we just leverage all of the advancement that we that we've had um and automate a lot of the lot of the data cleaning in the back end when it comes to actually, you know, preparing the data for analysis and um, and and cleaning it out and making sure we analyze response patterns and uh, unstructured unstructured text um, that our respondents are giving us. Uh, and you know, that's about that first step of just making sure the data is as good as it can be before it gets integrated anywhere. Yeah, no, that, these are all really interesting points. And uh, I guess we could just do a roundtable show here today. I guess I think it's going to be kind of fun. I'll throw this over to uh, to Kyle to kind of pick up on. I think Marie hit one key nail right out of his head, which is the issue of scale. And that's something that you certainly saw in your days at Uber. And I think it's uh, it's always important for our audience to appreciate how things change when you get to a scale like that. You cannot do manual processes when you're dealing with these scale out architectures. You have to use algorithms. You have to classify and organize and, and get very sophisticated about your approach. And you have to automate really whatever you can, right? Tell us a bit about that perspective and, and what you learned in your days and, and how you've used that knowledge to forge ahead with Big Eye. Yeah, I, uh, it was definitely fascinating to see what kind of failed uh, every like three to six months. Because uh, every if you're uh, as you're scaling up, things that maybe were a great decision at one point in time, and you know were the practical decision, just don't last. And that's a fact of of hyperscale, I guess. And it's okay, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. But it was it was definitely interesting to see what the breakpoints were. Um, the one thing that comes to mind for sure in the data quality area specifically was switching from a testing paradigm to an observability paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, so the we had, I wanna say there were 3000 weekly active users internally uh, when I uh, was uh, on the team. Uh, and that was anybody that was an analyst writing a query, building a dashboard. It might be a data engineer creating a pipeline um, for, you know, for their team to use. Uh, might be somebody adding a feature to the feature store um, that would be used in the ML platform. Um, and what uh, we tried initially to help folks say, hey, when something goes wrong in my part of the pipeline or even in the part of the pipeline that's upstream from me, how do I know about that before my end users do? Right. Uh, the easy approach in the beginning was, well, let's build a test harness. Um, so you could go in and write a query and say, hey, if the row count in the child table doesn't match the row count in the parent table, then we have a problem. Uh, or, you know, I don't want any duplicate values in this primary key column or something like that. Um, and that that was a great first step. Um, but that uh, you can already kind of see where that falls apart, right? Uh, you wind up with a thousand column table that's a bunch of, you know, ML features, or even if you wind up with a 75 column table, that's, you know, some really big fact table or something like that, that's used by a bunch of different teams. Um, you get to that size and it just becomes infeasible uh, to uh, anticipate every single failure case where you want to write a test for. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really where we had to start moving to an observability paradigm and instead say, well, why don't we just harvest metrics from each data set periodically? Oh. Um, and then, and then we can do signal processing techniques on those instead of, of asking a human to predict, uh, each possible thing that could go wrong and, and write a test case for it up front. That's so, that's so interesting. And I'll bring Rohit in here before the, the first break comes up, but I think it's fascinating to, to remember that you have to reevaluate. You have, you've made practical decisions like Kyle was saying, and they were the right decision at the time, but then you reach a point where you're like, all right, this is not working anymore. 
How can we change it? And I love, and you see this all around in the observability space, which I absolutely love because now we can see things. And once you can see little signals that you couldn't see before, that gets very useful for troubleshooting and for planning and so forth. And I was really impressed with the demo I took from you guys the other day where you're pulling from lots of different sources and helping kind of coalesce that bigger picture view. And that's the future, right? We're gonna have to continue doing exactly that adding in new sources, constantly checking them, but have that automated and have the dependencies clear. What do you think about all that, Rohit? Yeah, so I think, you know, Carl made some really interesting points that, you know, you start, make a decision, it feels right, but it breaks down pretty quickly. You know, if you just abstract out and, and up level a little bit, I think what we're seeing is, you know, the early days of software development life cycle. You know, I might as well even call it, you know, data development life cycle. I think the practices are not standardized, but the challenge also is that, you know, when you have tables, which have like, you know, thousand columns, it's pretty ordinary, right? You know, you have tables with 20,000, you know, sometimes columns and, and that almost becomes unmanageable. You know, you have no idea what's coming. You don't know which transformation upstream created that table and how long is that table supposed to live? What's like the veracity of it? What is it supposed to contain? What's the, you know, the velocity at which new data is getting added or when is it expected to refresh. And I think mm -hmm. this is a reality that everybody is today dealing with, whether it's a telco, whether it's a retailer, whether it's a bank, you know, just managing transactions. I think everybody's just dealing with all of this. Now, our viewpoint has been very simple that, you know, you've got to basically thread the needle and therefore, you know, to your point that can you bring all these systems together and can you observe the signals that are coming from the infrastructure, from the quality of data, from the pipelines, which abstract these business processes and give, you know, a holistic view of what does the data product look like today and what's like the inner ongoing. So we are out to sort of, you know, do a complete visualization of how does the landscape look like right now? What's the state of the union now? And is it going to get worse? Or is, are there ways by which you can make it better? And I think, you know, as times, you know, progress and as, as more people start investing in these practices, I think there's going to be a clear delineation between pre-production and post-production. I think there's going to be a lot of testing pre-production, but, you know, post-production, it has to be observability because, you know, testing is not the answer. So if you look at frameworks like, you know, great expectations or DBT, they're, you know, exemplary tools and technologies. And I think they will do a lot uh, better, but they'll do actually a lot better pre-production. Post-production, I think, you know, observability is almost mandatory. That's really, that's very interesting. We'll pick this up out of the break, folks. We're talking all about data quality and really where you can address some of these concerns. We'll get back with Marie Hence and Rohit Chowdhury and Kyle Kerwin right after the break. Don't touch that dial. You are listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Processes. What a fantastic lineup of guests, too. We're talking to Marie Hens from Toluna. We've got Kyle Kerwin from Big Eye and Rohit Chowdhury from a company called Excel Data. That's A-C-C-E-L Data. Look those guys up online. We're talking about data quality processes. And, you know, I think to myself, uh, one of the, the important things we've seen in recent years is companies that have an information architecture that is flexible enough to allow front-end workers to make changes to backend systems. And I mentioned these append only databases as, uh, as really useful in that regard, because you don't write over the data, you just append the data, then you can kind of roll back. So version control kind of stuff. But it's always good to know what people at the front lines see. They're the ones typically interacting with the customers or the partners or whomever. They're the most intimately engaged with the data as it's being used for a particular function. So why not let these people do something? I, I, I talk all the time about morale and the importance of having good morale in your organization. Well, friction points that don't get solved lead to frustration, which eventually causes morale. And that can just take a company down, quite frankly. And I think one of those friction points is when I'm an end user, I'm on the front lines of the company. People always tell me their name is misspelled. I am not able to fix that for them. Marie, I'll throw it over to you just to give your thoughts on that and, and then tell us your other thoughts about you know, how to improve data quality programmatically. 
Yeah, and what I think, um, Eric, you're hinting at there is also the responsibility of you know, sharing the responsibility of data quality and data accuracy. Right. So this isn't just one, you know, department or one person's job. This has to be a team effort, a cross company team effort where everyone who is in touch with the data, whether that's at the collection stage, at the uh, management storage stage or at the analytics stage is responsible for creating that feedback loop almost of mm -hmm. ensuring that the data quality and data accuracy is there. So if an analyst, for example, realizes that the data that they're looking at doesn't match up with market knowledge that they have or with data that they're getting from elsewhere, that feedback loop should be there to ensure that that can be reviewed to ensure was the data collected in an appropriate way? Was the data stored in an appropriate way? Is the data clean enough for the purpose that it's being used for. And um, you know, those tools that give access to different kind of users across that data journey, if you want, are extremely important to collectively ensure that data quality is, um, is at an appropriate level. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And I, I do love, again, that you're doing this market research. So you're capturing what is real world data. And then of course, for your clients, you're giving them access to things like benchmarks, uh, what you should expect in this industry or in that vertical or whatever. And that's great stuff. Real quick, Maria, I'll throw it back to you because you can have your own first party data and you have your own perspective on what's happening in the world. But guess what? We all have biases. Everyone has a bias. That's why you want a team around you to kind of point out blind spots, for example, or, or mention things that don't look right. You need to have a good corporate culture where people feel the, the what do they call it? The psychological um confidence to raise their hand and say hey i think there's a problem over here because if people don't feel that confidence they're not going to tell you and that's a real problem i mean there are whole books and movies written about this phenomenon but i love that you're bringing this real world data because it's it's a bit of a tonic and it's also a bit of a check and balance right to say it could be that in fact your view of the world is correct and that the rest of the world is different because your business model is different or your DNA is different or whatever. But it's always good to, to kind of just get a reality check and look at the real world and compare it to your own numbers. What do you think? Absolutely. You know, having that frame of reference and evaluating data critically is a part of the checks and balances and part of the feedback loop and part of the evaluation process of data quality. So, you know, not just taking the data as gospel almost and saying, well, this is the data and this must be true, but actually critically evaluating where it came from, what happened to it all the way up to the point where it was analyzed or used um, is, is part of the data quality journey without a doubt. That's right. I'll bring uh, Kyle Kerwin back in from Big Eye to kind of comment on that. You know, what are your thoughts about the importance of, of this collective responsibility? Understand that someone, one person needs to be responsible or one department, but nonetheless, it is a group effort and you want to make sure to keep lines of communication open across the organization and, and with your partners as well. Right, Kyle? Yeah, for sure. I think as you, as you scale up, you need more of the organization to be able to help tackle the problem together. And that I think really comes down to, can you divide up responsibility of that scope? So uh, that would mean being able to say, Hey, you know, here's raw data ingestion here's the group of people that are responsible for an SLA around raw data ingestion. And is that landing in the warehouse on time? Um, then totally separately, you might have a different group of people who are responsible for, you know, the kind of last mile of processing before that goes out and it's used in, let's say, marketing uh, analytics or something like that. And being able to map that pipeline uh, and split up uh, the responsibility for uh, problems that can occur in different stages of that pipeline and have that ownership be clear to those two different teams. That That's what allows you to get that sort of separation of responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you can route you can route those sort of uh, responses to the correct team when you detect a problem in a different place in your pipeline. Yeah, no, that's right. I'll bring in uh, Rohit to kind of comment on that as well. It is always important to to nail down your processes, know who's doing what, you know, I think a lot of that stuff is is easier to manage these days in part because of observability. That's one thing I love about the cloud. I feel like one reason why the cloud is so powerful is because we learned so many lessons through decades of on-prem and then along comes this interweb thing. And it took a while for, for big corporations to fully embrace it. But now I think it partly thanks to Microsoft, quite frankly, 
the, the broader big Fortune 500, Fortune 2000 world is all in on cloud. And everybody knows that cloud is the future. And in, in the sort of infrastructure of how cloud is built, you have all this information baked perfectly so that you can grab it. And that's what observability is all about now, right? It's like tapping into all these sources of signal to be able to see what's going on. What do you think, Rohan? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, the key point from a quality perspective, whether it's cloud or whether it's on-premise, is all about, you know, stewardship. And stewardship is essentially saying that, look, I own this data and I understand what the nuances are and I understand whether this is going to make sense for the business or not. You know, and, and this is not a generic field. This is very, very specific. You know, a healthcare data steward is, you know, domain intensive. They understand what's going on with the data that is eventually going to be available for, let's say, pharmacists to, to, to take a call on medical trials or, you know, medicine trials or whatever it comes out. I think it's very similar in the finance domain that, you know, if you're trying to look at arrive at ratios of, you know, cash in the bank versus cash that should have gone out from an advances point of view, even the slightest change could leave, let's say, $150, $200 million additional in the bank, which could have been, you know, very well in the money market. So I think we're talking about things that affect a lot of outcomes. And, you know, the bigger the outcomes, the more the stewardship is required. And, you know, the benefit of the cloud is that you can react faster. So to the earlier point that, you know, you were mentioning, you know, when, uh, you know, you had asked Marie this question that can the end users input or correct what they're seeing? I think the biggest benefit that you have is when you start thinking about your data in terms of domains that, you know, here is customer, that's a domain that, you know, it has its own set of pipelines. It runs on a kind of infrastructure and here is the outcome of the reliability of data. And, you know, here's another domain which is called finance or cards. And, you know, so many times we ran the credit card fraud check algorithm and this is, these are the outcomes that we got today. And therefore this data is reliable or it's not. But I think it's useful for, you know, large corporations or small to start thinking about their data in terms of, you know, various domains. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. You know, and as I think about um, the many challenges, and maybe I'll throw this over to, to Kyle to comment on first, we also have this whole reality of streaming data, right? Like a lot of the data quality processes and technologies that we built were all geared around data that is persisted somewhere in a database. Well, now we have all these different technologies to just stream data, right? In like a Kafka or a Flink or any number of other technologies. It's not Streaming is not tremendously new, but it's it's there are a lot of different technologies that are changing how it's done. How does that change the landscape, Kyle? And can you apply policies for persisted data that can be very easily ported over to streaming data? It's an interesting challenge. I mean, I can say that uh, part of the lineage mapping work that we did uh, at Uber was being able to tie data that was landing in, in HDFS up to you know a Kafka topic that it was coming from originally. Um, mm -hmm. And what was critical there was having a, a schema registry where if the team wanted to generate a new topic and expect that data from that topic would land in the data lake, that they would go to the schema registry to find their schema. You know, there's their topic, they can start publishing into it. And then they just know that that data is gonna arrive uh, in, a, you know, in a raw table in the lake and can be used downstream from there. Um, mm. I think in that case, it might be okay to actually apply data observability initially to the persisted data um, and just monitor it at rest. Um, that's still, you know, a step change above where I think a lot of organizations find themselves today if they're not doing observability at all. Um, just being able to monitor data at rest is still a huge uh, benefit. And then if you can start to move upstream after you have that sort of downstream piece covered, great. If you can start to monitor things like, you know, how many messages are moving through the topic um, or do we have null values and fields that, you know, we really don't expect to have nulls in then you can start to uh, identify issues earlier before they've landed. Um, but I think there's still a tremendous amount of value um, in starting your monitoring um, sort of downstream close to the end application and then sort of working backwards towards the uh, upstream sources. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll bring in Rohit real quick to, to kind of yeah. comment on that. Um, because as I think about all this stuff, there are, again, there are so many ways you can glean information. I think the one key point is you're always going to need people. All these new tools are great, but you're still going to need people to look at it, understand it, make comparisons, contrasts, call people, email someone. Hey, is this right? So you're never going to get to a point where it's lights out ever. I mean, the, the world is getting more complex by the day with new sources and new 
models and new uh, schemas and so forth. So you don't fear about losing your job, folks. It's just going to be a better tool to help you stay on top of what's happening. But there will always be need for people on the front end here, comparing, contrasting, emailing, you know, communicating around this stuff. Right, Rohit? Oh, absolutely. You know, to the earlier point the guy was mentioning, you know, we were one of the first companies to come and say, hey, listen, you know, observability applies all the way from your data in at rest, data in motion, and, you know, finally, data which is ready for consumption. Mm -hmm. So we actually, you know, give you an insight across all your systems, whether it's, you know, you're streaming data from Kafka using a Spark stream processor or whatever it is, right? And whether you're getting data from your relational data sources from CDC. So we actually covered the whole spectrum. Now, to your point about, you know, humans in the loop, I can tell you that, you know, humans can, you know, cannot deal with the complexity today, especially at the volume, and therefore they need tools. But tools alone do not bring in the domain expertise that humans have in their head. So it's got to be a combination. It is a, you know, a mutually important world right now, where you actually, if you don't apply skill sets and technology together, you're not going to get the right results. And, you know, no matter how much technology you apply and no matter how much machine learning and AI we apply to all of these, you know, different patterns, processing signals, we'll still miss out on some of the critical factors. So I think it's a combination of these two. The yeah, evolution of it, yeah, the evolution of it could be, you know, very intense domain-centric observability patterns, which, you know, at least we are already seeing in our customer base. Hmm. That's interesting. And Marie, I'll bring you in quickly to comment from your research, from what you've seen in data quality, do you see organizations gaining this appreciation for, I'll use the word, the terms that, that, that Kyle used, the step change? Because when you scale out, these scale out architectures, it's a whole different environment from the old manual processes of yesteryear. Are you seeing in your research that uh, the companies seem to be figuring out what these gentlemen are saying, which is, please, guys, get some tools and, yes, the people to work with them, but don't try to, you know, hack through these forests with a sword. What do you think? Absolutely. And actually, um, what Rohit said um, rings rang quite true, that kind of balance of people and tools and how it has to work together um, reminded me of uh, how we were applying um, NLP algorithms to clean some of our unstructured data. And one of the things that we check for is gibberish in unstructured, open-ended text answers, right? Um, so here's the challenge, though. A lot of uh, kind of Gen Z and, you know, kind of younger folks write in a lot of abbreviations, as we mm. learned as we were training our model. And in the beginning, we were accidentally in the training stage you know, removing a lot of those respondents because our gibberish model was flagging them for providing uh, data that it said, you know, wasn't wasn't good enough, but only human intervention was really then able to identify, no way, this is how these people talk these days. You know, this is how this group of respondents actually talks. These are valid abbreviations. So um, having that balance between the tools and um, and humans is is absolutely crucial, and you know it's something that we recognise that without tools and you know um, without the right technology, we're not really able to uh, to scale this mountain of data data quality. But it has to be done hand in hand. The tools can't do it on their own because there is still some subjectivity when it comes to what is accurate, what isn't, and one of the things that we need to watch out for is to not over clean the data where we actually remove data that right. was fine. We just thought it wasn't. That's right. Yeah. So hashtag SMH, hashtag LMAO, hashtag LOL. Absolutely. <laughs> These are all the uh, the clever little things you have to like, what does that mean? And don't be afraid to Google stuff, folks. Don't be afraid to Google <laughs> things when your kid says something like, all right, what was that? Oh, okay. Shaking my head. Laughing my A off, I got gotcha. you. Don't touch that dial, folks. We'll be right back talking all things data quality here on DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. Folks, back here on DM Radio, talking all things quality. Quality is as quality processes do. We've been talking to Marie Hens from Toluna, Rohit Chowdhury from Excel Data, and Kyle Kerwin from Big Eye. And uh, I was reminded in the break of my thesis back in college on deconstruction. 
Jacques Derrida wrote a piece, Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences, where he kind of broke down a structuralist view of the world. And in the data world, we, this, this is very clear. We have tables, we have schemas. These are the structures that we've come to, to know and understand and use. But the world is a very complex place. It can, it's hard to take a human being and compartmentalize them in some three-dimensional construct. Like, I mean, you can do it for purposes of understanding things and trying to make the best recommendations for their next purchase and so forth. But human beings are very complex creatures. Businesses are very complex. Even plants are complex. So there is something to be said for sort of hyper-structural thinking and finding the way to dissolve that and, and get around it. But what do you think about that, Rohit? Yeah, so, you know, go back a few years. You know, I could be described as a person with a phone number, a street address, an email address, and a mailing address. And, you know, I would be a customer, which is an inviolable entity within an enterprise, and I'm bona fide. But today, you know, how are you using uh, this information that you have about this person? You're actually not just using it flat. You're actually going and adding what are my buying traits? What are my browsing traits? What are my location trends? Where have I been? What is my recency data? So what ends up happening is that when marketing is approaching Rohit, he's approached, he's approached very, very differently from how, you know, a lender would approach Rohit because, you know, the lender knows my address and he only cares about, you know, whether he's going to find me or not. But marketing is very, very influential now today. You know, you're trying to influence my behavior. Therefore, you're trying to understand me better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're making big decisions. For example, you know, corporations are spending billions of dollars in advertising. And they're doing it, you know, they're targeting, they're hyper-targeting people on the basis of a better understanding of who this person is. So I think the biggest change that's happened in terms of you know data quality is that if you're going to make a financial decision which is to spend money on identifying the traits and the benefits that you know somebody like Rohit may get and to you know nudge him in a certain direction of purchase of a service or a product those data points have to be very very accurate and that is where i think data quality has completely changed that it's no longer about correcting phone numbers and zip codes mm. it's actually about identifying those additional attributes which the business has collected over a period of time and some of that may be very transactional and it's coming accurately from your own databases but some of it is coming from third-party sources and you're mm -hmm. just trying to you know acquire additional traits and identifiers from let's say my zip code but you're also superimposing my own being with you know the rest of the trends that exist in my you know zip code so I think that is where the whole lack of structure is hitting, you know, the previous generation data quality companies, you know, as I'm talking about industry, but, you know, every enterprise which deals with, you know, quality, because who's going to deal with this lack of structure when half of the data is still coming through streams and coming in with really high velocity. Mm. So I think those are the things that have completely, you know, gone off the rails and deconstruction applies. That's very interesting. And I'll bring in Kyle to comment on this. You know, you have schema on read, right? It, uh, it used to be in the old days that you'd have your schema for your data warehouse and you wanted to load data in. You had to match that schema perfectly when you loaded it in. Well, then they started talking about, oh, no, don't worry about that. Just dump it in the data lake and we'll do schema on read, which does make sense. It's a, it's a clever way of sort of decoupling the structures so that you can get more stuff in. But, you know, there are some pretty significant challenges around schema on read as well. But I, I think that fits pretty nicely into this whole concept of structure and structuralism and deconstruction. But what do you think, Kyle? Uh, during the break, when you were you were talking about uh, this idea of having your your internal mental uh, structure that you apply to the world around you, I was exactly thinking it's it's like schema on read, but, you know, for, <laughs> you know, the way the way you're going about you're living your life. Um, but I think this is, you know, we were talking earlier about like testing and observability. And I, I think this hits the nail on the head there, right? Which is that if the if the structure of the data is going to be in flux, then we can't we can't be sort of presupposing things or writing rules anymore. Like we have to move on from that to say, mm -hmm. this is the state of it, this is how it's changed. We now see uh, you know, the array, the shape of the array has changed. There's new fields that have appeared, old fields aren't populated anymore. Uh, the types of values that we see in a column have changed, and I think really, um, I agree with what with Rohit was saying earlier um, that we we have to be able to just handle that. That is the new normal, uh, and that means that again, with like an observability uh, approach to quality, you're just looking at what is there in sort of an unopinionated way, and then you're looking for signals that tell you that 
that something might be uh, impacting an application and you might need to do something about it, but it's a less opinionated, less structured approach. Yeah, that's a really, really good comment. And Marie, I'll bring you back in uh, with one of my observations from years ago in my philosophical discovery phase, which is that people notice differences. And what I mean by that is if something is the same all the time, you don't even notice it anymore because it's the same all the time. And your your brain really is designed to capture, to identify, and then process differences. What is different today or now than it was yesterday or a moment ago, whether that's you know a predator coming towards you or some prey that's available to you, whatever the case may be. The point is, if you do the same thing every day, your days are just going to sort of fly by and you're not even going to notice them. So to kind of shake things up is a very useful practice to, to be able to, again, gauge and re-gauge. Because even if you're not changing, the market is or some dynamic is in your environment. And uh, and let's face it, we all need to know what to focus on. I actually talked about this in, the, in a keynote a few months ago. Uh, what did I say? Priorities, biases, and solutions, right? So what are your priorities? Always be mindful of your biases. And then what solutions are you trying to build? And data quality can be a real good indicator of what to focus on. Because <laughs> if it's getting bad, you better start doing something to fix it. But what do you think about all that, Marie? Well, actually throwing back at, you know, your comment uh, that if you do something every day, you don't really notice it changing. It's like the frog in the pot, you yeah, know, you turn up right. the heat. If right. It may be changing, but you may actually not be noticing it because it's changing so gradually that, you know, it feels the same as yesterday, but it actually isn't. And I think that's, again, going back to the frame of reference and, you know, let's talk about data or data trends. If you're looking at your data and you see, oh, it kind of looks the same as last week, but last week looked a little different to the week before, and that looked a little bit different to the week before. It's important to take a step back. And when looking at the data we hold and the data we analyze to take that kind of bigger picture view and have a look at how data compares, not just to the previous week or the previous two weeks, but actually overall, whether a certain data story has changed. Mm -hmm. And again, that can identify whether there's any thing that has changed in how that data was collected, how that data is being cleaned, and whether actually any of those processes are impacting the data and therefore the insights that we get out of that data or the applications that we get out of that data. So the bias that you're mentioning, for example, is there any bias anywhere in that process of collecting the data, categorizing the data, are there certain assumptions being made about who should be included or excluded from the data? And may that be changing the outcome and the insights that, um, that are based on that information? So that bigger picture view in my eyes is just extremely important. Yeah, it's, uh, we're always a work in progress here. I'll get maybe a final comment here from Rohit. You always have to start somewhere, right? I used to lay out newspapers and uh, I would get the dummies from the crew in the back and they would show me all the space I had to fill with my content. And I would have to figure out which stories go where and which photos do I use to use up the space because it wasn't online, it was in print. And you have to cover for every little piece of print. And I learned very early in the ball game, you have to start somewhere and just building out and then you handle the sort of edge cases as you get towards the end. And I think that's what you have to do with data real quick. What do you think, Rohit? Yeah, I think, you know, look at your surface area. If you're an enterprise data leader, I think you've got to basically take stock of how big your surface area is, because in some cases it, it truly is hairy. Um, mm -hmm. and, and therefore you start with, you know, very specific small initiatives, finding out, you know, what, what are the financial implications of, of poor quality or, you know, unreliable data? What does it really change? You know, is it going to affect you by $100 million or $50 million? Right what is the real impact of you know um, lack of trustworthy data that would be my first suggestion second recognize that the world is multidimensional and so is you know so are data systems and therefore you know pay attention to all the different layers that can go wrong all the different problems that may go on uh, you know whether it's at an infrastructure level which is then causing delays in your streams and therefore you right. know data is appearing unreliable or you know transformation is just failing continuously or, you know, maybe the consumption layer is completely, uh, you know, out of whack and out of sync of, you know, where it should be. Mm -hmm. So I think identifying these, you know, multidimensional relationships between each of these and identifying, you know, what is the final data product that you intend to cater to and, and what is the audience. 
is it a business analyst community or is it the end consumer? Yeah, that's exactly right. Fantastic advice from all of our guests. Look these folks up online. Talk to Toluna, Excel Data, and Big Eye. So much fun learning from the experts, folks. You've been listening to DM Radio.